are you satisfied with your understanding of sustainability? If you are not, imagine a journey together, a pluralistic one, with academia, innovators, startups, NGOs, all looking for solutions to the greatest challenge of our time. My name is Samuele Tini, and this is the Sustainability Journey. Welcome to another episode, and today we are going to discuss something that is very interesting and then will give wonderful insight. We have the pleasure to have one of the top 100 women in aerospace and an expert. She has PhD, MBA, and then she sits on the board of startups and she is busy there uh, preparing the future of the aerospace sector. So thank you so much for being here, Suzanne Svensdotter. Thank you so much, Suzanne, for being here. Thank you, Samuel, for having me. And Suzanne, it's such a pleasure to have you. You have so many titles and your impressive research and, and, the, and the work now that you are doing in innovation in the aerospace and one of the leading women. But before that, as usual, we ask in the photo, what is your background? Who is Suzanne? Suzanne comes from Sweden and was always interested in, in technology. I was hanging with my dad, who, who was an engineer. When I was going to choose for university, I didn't think about a lot of other things. So I started engineering school and um, ended into the energy sector program where we learned about turbine machines. And I thought that was very interesting. And somehow I got the offer to do, go and do a PhD in turbine machines. So I did that. And then I got an offer to go to Imperial College in London to do a postdoc. And I did that. And then all of a sudden I was offered a job at Rolls-Royce. Rolls-Royce Defense Aerospace making jet engines. So I went there and I, I loved it there. I mean, this, I have to say, I know this publicity, but it, it was the best place I've ever worked. And I take this as a future uh, gold standard for a future company that I'm building up now. Uh, anyway, uh, due to family reasons, I left Britain and I moved to France. My husband is French and I've spent almost uh, 15 years in the oil and gas sector. Uh, or still working on turbine machines. And then I stumble upon a person who is starting a company making electric uh, flying taxis, and he needed someone with turbine machine experience to work on the engine. And that gave me a chance to go back to the aerospace industry, which is a sector that I love, and uh, to try the very exciting business of uh, starting a company. Which is exciting. <laughs> yes, it is exciting and extremely scary, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> so you have become like you have joined the startup movement and then you are you are a, a change maker now trying to to, to put innovation in, in in the sector it's wonderful Suzanne it's really you see the, the progression and the impressive uh, work that you have done now the, the question is you are as I said the top 100 women somebody who is a recognized expert in the field can you explain a bit when we think about a airspace in our mind, as lay people, we think of rockets, we think of many people jumping up and down the moon and going to Mars. Can you, can you explain a bit what is the sector and also which are the problems? The word aerospace is used differently by different groups. So I, my own definition of it, I think about it as aviation, aerospace and space. So for me, aviation, that's flying with planes, uh, being in the atmosphere, Aerospace is the manufacturing part. You make the engines, you make the airplanes, etc. And space is flying in space, uh, using satellites, uh, etc. That's my own personal division of it. Others may have other ways of defining it. The main problem, obviously, as, as many other sectors, is the climate change and the impact on climate change that the aviation, aerospace, and space sectors have. And so the decarbonization is, is really important, not only for the actual flying, but for the entire manufacturing process. Um, I also think when it comes to flight, there should be some thoughts about the pricing, because I, I can take an example from Europe. If I fly from, for example, Paris to Geneva, it is very often so that the direct flight is more expensive than if I go on several flights around Europe because of the pricing issue. I mean, airliners, they lower the prices when they have empty seats, which kind of makes sense for one 
trip. But if you're going uh, around Europe uh, on cheap flights just to go from A to B, and that's a waste, and it gives the wrong wrong impression of, of flying. I have noticed this sometimes when looking for flights, I was like, wow, <laughs> how is it possible that a direct one is there? And as you said, it, it really gives people the wrong signal. If you look at a more utilitarian way, I mean, of course, it's the end of price is not the, the correct way. And then, you know, you, you mentioned decarbonization of sustainability is the big challenge for an industry that if you look at the journal now, the newspaper, they will say, you know, it is one of the biggest culprits. You know, we have to cut fly, we need to cut the way. How we can, how, how, for example, especially from your perspective, the innovation and which is the future of this sector? Because, of course, we cannot ground ourselves. We need to move. And I mean, it will, will not be possible. People are moving. That's a fact. And, and um, I think we have to see the transport system as, as a whole, not seeing flying for itself, train by itself, cars by itself. We have to look at the the entity as a whole. Because I think that in some areas, trains might be the best solution. Other areas, cars or buses might be the best solution. And in some areas, flying might be the best solution. And we should not forget shipping. Uh, because, for example, the area where I am trying to go with, uh, with the flying taxis, we are thinking of rural areas where there are not a lot of infrastructure. And if you say that train, for example, is always best, then you have to consider the resources that are needed to build a railway, which is not insignificant, and building roads as well. In those areas, I think that, you know, the idea of flying taxis that you share, we use the word taxi because we think of something that you rent, you take one trip, you pay for the trip, you don't buy it yourself. It's a sharing society. I think that could be uh, a good idea, but you have to look at it from a whole side. I do not believe that flying taxis, for example, is a good idea to reduce uh, congestions in big cities, because you can just imagine you have congestion in big cities, you want to put all of that up in the air instead. I would find that very scary. And I mean, in big cities, there are other means of public transportation that people ought to be able to use. I really want to, to understand a bit more oh, from your research and the startups, you know, you are, you are sitting on the board and your position, which are the, the trends. You have discussed this example and especially the startup you are building on flying taxis. Can you give us some more stories and examples there in this space? Well, I mean, lots of people are, are wanting to do uh, electric flying taxis with the technical term is EV toll, so it's electric vertical takeoff and landing, which means that you don't have to have airports, which is also saving on infrastructure. And yes, that, that is an interesting development. You have to bear in mind, if you think of electricity as a green transport way, you have to think of that you actually have to produce the electricity and you have to have batteries. For now, most people who are working on flying taxis and, and electric airplanes think of batteries. You still have to produce the electricity and you have to produce the batteries. And if we produce electricity by burning oil and coal and we produce batteries with cheap uh, child and slave labor, this is not really sustainable. It's not what we mean with sustainable and not equal either, uh, which is one of the reasons why I am, I am looking into uh, to actually make an engine that charges the battery, a small turbine engine that charges the battery, which you can run on green fuel. So I, I'll continue a bit with the av aviation sector, and then we could talk more about our visions for the future. Uh, because another exciting um, development in the aviation sector is, uh, is using green fuel, sustainable aviation fuel or stuff. Uh, currently, there are investigations done on, on hydrogen. There are test flights with hydrogen and there are test flights with other or where you're mixing in a certain amount of, of green fuel. Hydrogen has its own problems as well because it depends on how you are producing the hydrogen. But I think that there are opportunities for countries in Africa to produce hydrogen. I know that Oman, for example, have a huge program on to produce hydrogen with solar panels and water. Because when you burn hydrogen, you get water. 
the problem is producing the hydrogen. So again, if you are burning oil to produce hydrogen, then you haven't won anything. It, it's really about looking at the entire chain of, of production. It's where I see the future of aerospace. I mean, we, de- we do have to decarbonize. The question is that sometimes we pose to startup when we read about the startup and innovation. Is it just now in the lab? Or is it something that you foresee from your experience that is going commercial? For example, this hydrogen, green hydrogen, or the sustainable fuel that you are discussing. When do you think that this can eat there are the, already the ground? Airplanes testing hydrogen, so that can come quite quickly. The main problem there would be the the infrastructure of providing hydrogen to the airplanes, and then mm-hmm. of course, as I earlier mentioned, producing hydrogen. You have to have, hydrogen is an extremely flammable gas, so you have to have very high safety standards for it. Uh, actually, yesterday I saw a news emission on a news, news clip on French television about a guy who's driving with hydrogen car, a hydrogen car here in France. Uh, so there is technology that works. Uh, his problem was that he couldn't find a lot of gas stations that uh, that provides hydrogen. So that is the infrastructure uh, problem. When it comes to electric planes, uh, there are tests ongoing. The technology is there. It's more a certification issue. Hydrogen also, you have to do certification, but you, you have to be able to provide to show security, uh, efficiency, and, and uh, a lot of things with, with the certifications. And that is what takes time. Uh, I have friends who are uh, test flying electric airplanes for the moment, so it's it's ongoing. I, I think we can see, at least for short distances, we can see electric airplanes fairly quickly. That will be wonderful, especially thinking of our context here, in, especially in, in Africa. Sometimes, especially for emergencies and movement and evacuation also of people, it will help a lot. And I'm thinking also in the conservation space, it will help a lot in that area. Flying taxis will take longer because there is more certification to do and there is technology development to do. Um, The advantage with electric uh, flying, it sounds insane, but by coupling the way we want to do it, we want to have a small turbine. Instead of a huge battery, we want to have a small turbine that charges a smaller battery and then this runs the engine. And it looks like we will use uh, efficiency on that because the more things you connect together, uh, the more you lose efficiency. Uh, But the thing is, well, already, uh, if you have a battery and an electric motor, you have forgotten the efficiency loss you have when producing the electricity because it's far away. Uh, But the thing is that an electric motor has the same efficiency regarding, regardless of what speed it runs, which means that if you connect the turbine, uh, a thermal engine, turbine or piston engine, has the an optimal efficiency at one speed, and then you lose efficiency very quickly. So if you couple an electric motor with a, with a turbine, you can run the turbine at the optimal speed all the time. You run it at a constant speed, and you can optimize the efficiency. And I also sometimes get the question that why don't you use the turbine directly? That's what we are doing in jet engines. And the efficiency of a jet engine is actually not very high because you use the jet to propulse the airplane, which means that all the, a lot of energy goes out in the jet. So the thermodynamic uh, efficiency is not very good. And you can optimize that if you don't need the jet. Very interesting. <laughs> yeah, so in theory, it works fine. Now we have to do it. And this is the challenge of scientists like you that they are at the forefront of the change making, you know, for people. That is exactly the type of research and, and the voice, you know, of, of the challenges that they can really transform the way we move and the way we work. A question for the future. What is your way forward? When do you think your vision will be there? My personal uh, vision is that in 10 years' time, before I take my uh, take go on retirement, that I can fly in one of our flying taxis with our uh, flexi-fuel engine. Our vision with the company is to work, as I said, in rural areas, for example, in African countries. And when you have 
an engine that you can run with green energy and flex if you we want to bake the engine so that you can put any fuel more or less in it and so i see a future where rural communities can produce their own fuel from agricultural waste or other waste and then run transport with it a flying taxi or having a small energy production producing electricity with the green fuel or uh, tractors for the for the the farms i recently read an article from a actually a model farm in sweden they produce milk so it's a milk uh, producing they have milk cows they use the waste from their cows plus the heat from the milk that they uh, collect from the cows and they cover nine with all that energy they cover 90 percent of their energy need in that form and totally understand that small scale farmers cannot do that themselves because it's a big installation to build but a community could do that and you can put human waste you can put uh, cattle waste you can put other agricultural waste then you will create methane most of the time and you can have that uh, together with an electric tractor to run a tractor or in an airplane to to dr- run a flying taxi and you won't need to build roads to the isolated communities you have a taxi that you share so you don't have to pay for it one of your previous uh, interviewees was with a scheme of of tractors and uh, communities re- hiring tractors we see something similar for our flying taxi that you share it within the community and we also have a vision of not only sharing the taxi, but also having a local production. So we do not want to build flying taxis in France and ship them to, for example, Africa. We would like to help African countries to make a factory or a couple of factories to build electric taxis, flying taxis there. Because it's also one of our beliefs that we have to diversify. The pandemic and also the war in Ukraine has shown how important it is not to rely on just one or two countries for production of something specific. We have to diversify. And this will go a long way to ensure sustainable development and really transform the way that communities are far away. They will have means of transport, reduced cost, and really be self-sustainable. Yes, that's our hope. I mean, our vision for this flying taxi is that it should run on no more than one liter fuel per person and 100 kilometers which is very little and my boss the the one who started the company has made a theoretical calculation and in theory it can work then of course there is lots of uh, lots of things we need to do before that and i know that generally for example African countries or many African countries are not considered to have a very high standard of manufacturing competencies. But, you know, Africa is changing. There are lots of young people who are interested in aviation and aerospace. And so I do not see that as a problem because you can learn. Really, Suzanne, I can see a vision here that could be transformative of the way I know you cannot tell all because you are still working and many things. And that's why you are also there with your expertise and work to really make all these technicalities that I know sometimes even for us lay people they are a bit difficult but to make this dream working because of course from ideation to you know execution of course there is a lot of technicality and work that you have to to perform we we are just now starting uh, to define the research we need to do (laughs) and you know now I wanted to ask something you know you are definitely an expert and a scientist and also in a sector that usually we associate with men and white men that is actually even the a specific category so to see already you know you are a, one of the leader of this transformation you know, bringing the gender diversity and also your push to have manufacturing the world you have discussed you know the vision to have manufacturing of highly technological goods and and you know all the work of the the taxis in in country they are not traditionally you know associated with those space it means that you are a champion on diversity inclusion and your really work you have been now nominated one of the top 100 women in aerospace so the question really goes to how we can ensure this diversity and inclusion in this uh, area which are the constraints which are the, the the way the way are you working there the constraints are biased because nowadays you will find few people who openly say that 
women should not be in aerospace or black people should not be in aerospace, etc. So it's subconscious bias. So the first thing for everyone is to realize that we are all biased. I mean, you can be a minority and be biased against someone else without, and if you don't realize that, you don't work on your Yourself. You have to start working on yourself. I usually like to talk about it as in majority and minority, where the majority are the sort of the, the ones who's, who are the norms in the company. So typically the white males and the minority is everything else. Because whether you are a woman or you are a black person or you are a gay person or you have different religions, the discrimination works the same way. So it, those are the mechanisms. And you have to approach it differently whether you come from, you know, the organ organizational point of view and you want to have in more minorities or if you are a minority and you want to move in uh, because as a minority wanting to go into a sector you can't force them uh, legislators can force and that is when you have quota quotas and things like that which i think sometimes you need to have it in order to push things but generally it becomes a, a box ticking exercise so you say, I want to have one person of that type, and I want to have one person of that type, and you kind of forget the competencies in between. And it doesn't make any service to anyone, because if you are unlucky, it can actually enhance bias, make bias even more, because you, you imagine you, you hire a woman because she's a woman, and then it turns out she wasn't good for the post. And then you have lots of people who will say that, well, we were right, women are not good for this. So that is... You know, sometimes it could be good to push it, but general, I think that's not a good idea. On the minority side, the only thing you can do, you can push, offer yourself to post, even if you don't have all the qualifications, because I can assure you that white men always uh, push themselves forward, even if they don't have the, the, uh, all the qualifications. I mean, I can tell you a story from when I was offered the postdoc at the Imperial College in London, my first thought was, this is not exactly what I was doing as a PhD student. So I don't think I could accept this. And I told all my male colleagues in the, in the I only had male colleagues in the laboratory where I was. And I remember the situation. They were all looking at me as if suddenly I had grown an extra head or something. And they basically told me, you're crazy. If it was me who got an offer like that, I would say yes first and learn about the subject afterwards. And this is an error that minorities often do, thinking that we have to know everything first and then we can apply for the position. So that is one thing. And then network. Network between minorities support each other. Since I discovered that I myself is biased against female engineers and scientists, mm -hmm. I have worked on myself to make sure that I support other uh, females. I'm also very supportive for diversity in general because I think it's more fun. It's, it's more interesting, more st intellectually stimulating to work with uh, lots of different people. It's not always easy because you will have different opinions and you will have difficulties sometimes with understanding each other, but you have to work on that. From an organizational point of view, uh, you have to formalize it. So first that you know what competences you need and make sure you actually look at the competencies of the people who are applying in an objective way, and that when you evaluate people's competencies, that you also do it objectively, because there are research that shows that expectations and evaluation of competencies depends on bias. So you can you 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 get guided by your bias, and the more formal you have made it from the beginning, the less. Uh, the bias comes in. W wonderful. Thank you so much, Suzanne, for these wonderful tips, because I think they will enable people, you know, just to act and work on themselves, especially I like the, the first you work on yourself, you change yourself and then start to be proactive, creating your network and, and really working also, you know, how to be also present yourself and try to, to really change what is the, the perception in your system. And then I, I know how difficult is it in your sector. And I mean, it's not, it's not by chance that you are one of the top 100 women in this sector because of the work that you are doing. I want to ask this uh, question. It's, you know, we are approaching the end of the episode. What is your final message, the one you want to, to give to our uh, audience? Can help us with the climate change. 
but we have to use technology wisely because we can also do lots of things. Uh, but we also, and that is the Western world, the rich world, have to reduce uh, consumption. Uh, we should equalize, uh, diversify opportunities, equalize different parts of the world. I mean, why should some people in some countries have several cars and people in other countries not being able, able to eat? It makes no sense and we, we need to do better. And it, it's not easy for the Western world when you are used to a certain standard mm. to lower your standard, but that is, that is what we have to do. And thank you, Suzanne. And the work that you are doing, I think it's really in the direction of creating a sustainable world, a world that is also less unequal. Inequalities are the one that really create the difference and create tension within the country and within countries. So thank you so much, Suzanne, for your work and for your wonderful results. And I'm sure, as I said, we already book you for another episode in the future to see where your work is, is rich and your startup if it's already flying in some skies. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Thank you. Are you satisfied after this wonderful episode? Let's continue together our sustainability journey.